evening to you once again. We would like to acknowledge our online audience at this time who are joining us on the various platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all the others viewing from the World Wide Web. We thank and welcome you to our Wednesday Pastors Bible Study. And good evening. Many times over the years as a body of Christ, we have been praying for or our attention were usually being drawn to the church in different geographical locations. The persecuted church, the underground church, the western church, and the list goes on and on and on. This could be the first time in history, and I stand to be corrected, that the church in all the ge geographical locations are now going through the same thing simultaneously, all at once. But yet, at the same time, it seems that the body of Christ globally are in the similar particular place, not geographically as such, but strategically positioned on the potter's wheel. This should make us attentive and comply to what the Lord is doing and what he is about to do. I do not think this is a coincidence. At this time in history, this event circumstance has affected the church globally. Since you see, if we are going to usher in the end time harvest and meet the bridegroom, we can't if our vessels are marred. Should we not take stock? The word, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my word. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay are marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, and it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter, says the Lord? Look as, look as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. This is Jeremiah 18, verses 1 to 6, and this is taken from the New King James Version. And the title of my message is On the Potter's Wheel. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to you again this evening, Almighty God, we pray, O oh God, that you will speak to our hearts and our lives, our spirits, even now, Almighty God. Even now, God, we pray, O oh God, for a spirit of understanding and a knowledge, O oh God, that you can minister to us, O oh God. Give us a receptive heart, O oh Almighty God, and an attentive ear, O oh God, to your word, O oh Almighty God. As we commit this time into your hands, O oh God, have your way in us and to us, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. On the potter's wheel. I say Jeremiah 18, verses 1 and 6. The potter's wheel. The potter's wheel was one of the mankind's early invention and has changed surprisingly little in the last 6,000 years. A potter's wheel is not just a wheel, but not just one wheel, but two. Primitive potter's wheel were made of stone. A dish shaped stone was notched in the center to fit over a pointed pivot in the center of the lower stone. A nudge of the potter's toe set the lower wheel in action, which rotated the upper wheel. The upper wheel was where the potter shaped his clay. And the picture that forms of a potter is someone sitting on a stool, a wet glob of clay spinning on a wheel. As I research pottery making in biblical times to see different it may have been. In Bible times, potter's wheel were also made of stone or wood. The two wheels were joined by a shaft so that the upper wheel was at hand level. The foot moved the lower this and the connecting axle caused the upper wheel to revolve. 
clay was common in the ancient Near East. Archaeologists has discovered a great deal of evidence related to pottery making in ancient Israel, including remains of workshops, potter's wheel, tools, fight on fire, vessels, prepare clay and cleanse. Pottery play a virtual and important role in everyday lives of the people of the biblical times. Why were they made? What purpose are they made for? How are they made? Finally, he shapes the clay into a vase, a pitcher, or whatever he chooses. And as we go through the process on the potter's wheel, our first process is gathering the clay. Before the potter can start, he needs to gather the clay. Clay is usually found in unusual places because they are the smallest particles in salt. All partic clay particles stay suspended in water together, then sand or slick part particles. This tendency to stay suspended in moving waters and to settle slowly in calm waters allow clay to form beds where water sat still at some time in the distant past. As a result of this, the best place to find clay are along flood plains of rivers and streams are on the bottoms of ponds, lakes, and seas. Finding clay often requires a lot of exploring and time consuming on finding the right clay or finding the right sort of clay. And then you dig in and gathering the clay. At this stage, the clay is very dirty, even sometimes even smelly. After the clay had been extracted from the ground, it was brought to the potter's house to be prepared. And how many times God goes searching for us, even in our muck, even in our dirtiness. He goes, he goes the length, even exploring and digging until he finds us. And as we continue on the potter's wheel, as we continue on the potter's wheel, the next process is wedging. Or you call it well, wedging the clay, or sometimes you call it cleaning, cleaning the clay. When clay is first brought in form, when clay is first brought in from the field, it is unusable. It is hard and full of impurities. The potter searches out and he removes any little sticks, he removes stones or impurities. It is at this stage the potter kneads and molds the clay. Wedging makes the, more, wedging makes the clay more pliable. It ensures a uniform consistency. It is a difficult work with clay. It is difficult work with clay on the potter's wheel when clay contains air bubbles. It will not form correctly once it is on the wheel, makes the vessel walls collapse. Kneading is essential to even out the clay body to remove air bubbles, which can cause bloating or explosion during firing. This is a very tedious process. But this step in the process is very important. Sometimes this process is done with rods. The clay is placed on a table and beaten with the rod until it is smooth and all the impurities are removed. As the clay must be refined, so too must the Christian be refined before he or she can be shaped into a useful vessel. This reminds us of our spiritual lives. God turns the great spotlight of his Holy Spirit on our lives and points out areas that need to be removed. Many times we want to go straight to the wheel and become the vessel but God sees the importance of each step in our processes of formation. Wedging is that moment when we are in between a rock and a hard place. The process can be painful, but it's absolutely necessary. If the potter does not remove all the impurities and air pockets from the clay, it may explode when it placed in the furnace. 
This will destroy the vessel and may damage or destroy other vessels that are in the clink with it. Because of our sinful, sometimes because of our sinful attitudes and behaviors, we can be detrimental to ourselves and those around us. Of, often parts of ourselves that we do not like, it comes to the surface. When we are in a wedding season, we may not know unbelief, anger, or pride, or whatever sin were inside of us until the pressure made them surface. These are the issues of life that will make us fall apart on the wheel of formation if we skip the wedding. Also, these are the issues of, these are the issues that can make us burst when life turns up the heat and times of testing occur. As a child of God, will you want to be the cause of some person's destruction because you refuse to change or deal with that air bubble or air bubble that needs to be removed? We must be open and receptive to the Holy Spirit as he instructs us about areas we need to remove. Jesus said, he that have my commandments, and this is in John 14, verse 21, 23, and 24. Jesus said, he that have my commandments, just summarizing it, and keepeth them, he, it is he that loveth me. If a man love me, he will keep my words. He that loveth me, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sins. Just so, if we are to be vessels that are useful in God's service, we must stay on the table until all the impurities are removed. The pressure that comes from the wedding is not to condemn the clear into perfection. It is an invitation for the clay to be surrendered and obedient. I'm going to mention that again. The pressure that comes from the wedge is not to condemn the clay into perfection. It is an invitation for the clay to be surrendered and, and obedient. Only as we surrender to God and not rush the potter and allow him to clean all the dross from our lives, we will become vessels fit for the master's use. And as we continue on the potter's wheel, it is not well gathering of the pot of one, but then the following step is cleaning or wedging. But also, too, as we, as we continue through the stages now of forming or shaping, or shaping the clay. After the clay is thoroughly cleaned, it is ready to go on the wheel. The potter forms the clay into a lump and places it on the wheel. He begins to stir it. And as the lump spins in time to bring up the walls of the vessels, building the walls of the, of the vessel in an intricate process based on proper pressure, timing, and watering. To build the walls, to build the walls, the potter pulls, it pulls the clay walls by supporting the inside of the clay volcano with one hand and applying the pressure with the sponge or the fingers on the outside of the clay with the other hand. With each full rotation of the wheel, the potter takes one pass to bring up the clay. Each pass swift the height of the clay walls to a new level and the potter rushes this process by making the rotation of the wheel go too fast, the clay will be stretched too fast and cause cracks in the walls, which will make the clay collapse and unsuitable for firing. As the potter is pulling up the walls of the clay, he moistens his hands and shapes the clay. The moisture is very important. If it's too dry, it will pucker and resist. If it's too wet, it will refuse to assume the shape the potter desires. 
he must ensure that the clay is watered so that it can be malleable and surrendered to the hands of the potter. And as we continue in the process of the shaping, first for timing, because God is a God of purpose, he has a purpose for every season of our lives. Even though we cannot see, and this we see that in Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 said, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under the sun. Verse 3 speaks of a time to break down and a time to build up. Times of building are so exciting that we often fight the urge to rush the process. God has a process of building patience and good form in the process of building us up. We do not know the vessel that the master potter is forming us to be, but he knows. When we rush ahead of God's timing, we can be too weak to withstand the growth required of us. Even after David was anointed, and we see even after David was anointed king, he had to wait many years before he actually ruled. He sat under King Saul and learned how to be king, as well as what not to do. Additionally, the walls of Jericho did not fall the first time the children marched around them. God told them to march seven times and let out a shout unto God. As they follow God's timing, God provide they the miracle. To be strong vessels, we must be in step with God's timing because he knows the pace to set for us. We may feel like it is taking forever for us to grow into what we feel like God is leading us to be. Maybe we feel like everyone around us is forming so much faster. New job, marriage, children, college, etc. There is a multitude of circumstances that can make us feel like if we are moving slowly. But we must trust God's timing. He hasn't forgotten about us. He is near. And the next, and the next process in, in the forming, the next step in the forming process or the, the shaping process is the pressure and the pull. The pressure of the potter's hand produces the stretch and growth that the walls of the vessels need in order to be formed into the potter's vision. Applying too much pressure to the walls of the vessel will also cause the clay to become weak and crack. The clay must surrender to the hands of the potter to stretch and grow. We are constantly invited to allow God to use the circumstances in our lives of pressure upon us and form us into the vessels he envisions. We were never meant to be apathetic. We were meant to be marvelous works of the great creator. God can use this pressure for a purpose, not to push us down, but to pull us into and support growth. As the potter is pulling up the walls, he begins to form the vessel in the desired shape, forming into the vessel that the master's potter envisions, requires each of us to lean into the, the pulls and the pushes, but this is a challenge. To be formed, we cannot stay small and immature. We cannot conquer the highest challenges or rise above the pressure in our own strength. Facing this reality is a pretty big blow to our self-esteem. But this is exactly the place God meets us. When we reach the end of ourselves, we realize that we need, our, we need our need for God. We cannot rise to be anything in our own strength. We have to allow God to gently press us into his calling in his timing, and as he pulls, we stretch in form. And the last point on the forming process is watering. How can we stay malleable enough or flexible enough to be formed by the timing and the pressure? Water. 
the clay must be properly watered so that it's flexible enough to be pulled up and stretched by the potter. The Holy Spirit and the word of God are the water that keeps us available to God's pull. We need the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts and the word of God to renew our minds so that we can stay surrendered to the master's potter's vision for our lives. And the next process on the potter's wheel is drying. Sometimes you call it the leaded hard process. And this is, uh, this is the next process on the potter's wheel. After the vessel is shaped and separated, the potter places it on the shelf for drying. The process shows, the process slows to a halt at this stage. Before there were lots of activity, there were digging, they were beating, they were probing, they were cleaning, they were forming, and they were spinning. But now there is rest. The on fire vessel will collapse if it is filled with water or too much moisture is present. The clay vessel will release so much steam into that may cause it to burst at extreme levels. It will break if it's handled roughly. The drying and the resting are very important. The vessel will break and be useless if it is fired before it is properly dried. Each vessel must reach this point before it can be fired. And this is an example of what often happens in our lives. Sometimes we experience per periods or seasons of dryness in our spiritual lives and sometimes we call it the wilderness the, wil the wilderness season sometimes the dryness in our spiritual lives maybe comes from fatigue from stress and strain of life we seem to be on god's shelf out of surface maybe it is the waiting surface season where we feel dry we've been formed and we feel that like we are ready to take on the calling that God has on our lives, but God says, wait. All these points, we be, all these points, we become fragile. It can feel like there's no purpose for this season. However, this season is an invitation to the humble posture of stillness before God. What is inside of us slowly releases in the stillness. The washing of the water that made the clay flexible on the master's potter's wheel represent the word and spirit of God. The water soaks inside the vessel and is slowly released as the vessel becomes bone dry. Our current placement in our processes may not look like our purposes to us, but through the progression, God can use dry times in our lives to build maturity into us. He can teach us valuable lessons that will increase our usefulness to him. God used these times to prepare us for greater service. It is important that we rest and see what God is teaching us. It is important that we keep pursuing communion with God, even in the dry times. If we persist, we will break through into glorious fellowship with him. And the purpose of the process is the preparation of our promise in the quiet Stillness at the feet of Jesus and his word is where we find the promises of God. Let us be patient when God places us on the drying shelf. And as we continue on the potter's wheel, the potter has gathered us. 
Then the potter had to wedge us. And then the potter had form us. And, and the potters had dry us. And the next step is firing. You should call it clay firing or the firing the clay. When the vessels had dry sufficiently, the potter places it in the clay for the firing process. The temperature must be incredibly hot, approximately 2,000 Fahrenheit, which is 1,100 Celsius for the furnace to do its job. As it is heated, the vessel experiences change, <coughs> excuse me. As it is heated, the vessel experiences changes in its molecule structure, which make it useful and watertight. The vessel will dissolve if water were put into it before the firing. But after the firing, it will hold water for years. The fire draws out the final amounts of water from the chemicals bonds of the clay and burns out the carbon from the clay. This process fuses the clay particles together, making the vessel density and strength increases. When the clay is bis biscuit fired, it transforms from a most vulnerable state or fragile state to a strong vessel. The vessel that was soft and easily marred becomes hard and durable. The fire that burned, it caused it to become a useful vessel. Trials of this life. Trials of life can be grief. And all of us go through these trials of life. It can be grief. It can be temptation, it can be the emotional pain, disappointment, financial hardship, life-threatening sickness, or even persecution. No matter the cost, trials of life can be extremely difficult season. Peter encouraged the Jewish Christians who were dispersed into different nations and suffering, as he said. And this is taken from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the furry trials, which is which to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceedingly joy. Rejoice in suffering. It's not something that anyone wants to do. Rejoicing in suffering. It's not something anyone wants to do. But Peter is sharing revelation from God. In the context of this scripture, he shares that it's a blessing to bear the name of Jesus and the possible persecution that comes with a commitment to Christ. Life on the earth, life on this earth that is under the curse of sin and death will include trials. However, we cannot choose to allow our suffering to inspire dependence upon our strength of the Lord. Jesus is no stranger to suffering. He empathizes with the suffering of this life, both great and small. And in Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 15, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, 
but was in all points tempted as we are yet, but yet without sin. And Jesus' compassionate presence in the form of the Holy Spirit will meet us in the fire as the Son of Man met Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego after they held their righteous confession to faith. God can use the fires of life to strengthen us so that we are able to hold the glory that God, our master potter, wants to reveal through us. When scripture speaks of the glory of, of when scripture speaks of God's glory being revealed in earthen vessels, it's talking about the people of God. It's talking about us who call upon his name, those who have accepted him. It's talking about the people of God. The fire draws out what we consume and hold inside of us. If we allow the word and spirit of God to fill us, then the fire will draw out that out of us. Through God's word and presence, we may be strengthened. The fires can strengthen our character and trust in God as we experience his presence in our suffering. God can also work in the midst of fire to burn off impurities inside of us, like the carbon is burnt off from the clay vessels. And through this process, we strengthen, we are strengthened, refi refined, and able to reveal the glory of God as we reflect the master's potter's likeness and vision. And as the vessels and as the clay have come through these various stages, the gathering of the clay, the wedging of the clay, the forming of the clay, the drying of the clay, the firing of the clay. Now we have the using the vessel. After the vessel is fired, it is ready for use. The potter who makes the vessel, as he sees fit, determines the use of the vessel. From the same lump of clay, he can make a porcelain vase for a king's palace or a garbage pot. Sometimes we aren't satisfied with how God made us or the place he put us for surface. And I want us to take a look at that picture you're seeing on the screen. And when I was going through this research, I came across this. And I purposely chose this picture. Because if we are saying that God is going to use us, we are saying there on the vessel, there are different types of vessels. And each type of vessels have different names. You're saying they have different shapes. They have different sizes. You see their heights are different. Some are bar broader. Some are thin. Some are short. Some are tall. Some have one handle. Some have two. Some have none. Some have covers. Some have none. And as I check this photo made of Terracotta, which is fire clay, is the ancient Greek pots and cups or vases as they are normally called. Were fashioned into a variety of shapes and sizes, as we can see here on the screen. And very often a vessel's form correlates with its intended function. For example, the crater was used to mix water and wine, a Greek symposis, where an all-male drinking party. It allows an individual to pour liquids into its wide opening. It stirs the contents in its deep bowl and easily access the mixture with a separate ladle or small judge. Judge, judge, judge. 
Excuse me, judge. Jug, sorry, jug. <laughs> or the vase known as a hydria was used for collecting or carrying and pouring water. It features a, a bubbless body, a pinch stout spout, and three handles, two at the sides for holding and one stretch along the back for tilting. And as I mentioned before, we are not satisfied, and we see it all over. We are not satisfied with how God made us or placed us in, surf, in surface. But you'll see that every one of these have a particular purpose. They were not jealous of each other. They were not envious of each other. Because they recognize their purpose. They recognize that they were shaped for the particular purpose they had to fulfill. The one with the two, the one with the two handles can say, I don't like myself, I want one handle. Or the one with the cover at the top and say, oh, my handle is too big, I want a smaller one. But each of them recognize their purpose. And we see earthen vessels, as in the Bible, made of clay were used for a different purpose, as I mentioned earlier. Every jar had its particular purpose. The potter made the jar to the specific purpose it was for. The jar, each vessel were made according to the purpose it will fulfill. And there were many types and various types of vessels. You have vessels for oil. You have vessels for cooking. You have vessels to store land deed. You had all, you had all various vessels for ashes, uh, vessels for spices, vessels for special ointments, variety of things. Not realizing, and we as people not realizing that each piece is uniquely made and no two are ever exactly alike. That's the beauty of the potter. The finished form is the creation of the designer. We need to gladly accept his will for our lives. Never argue with him and always serve him wherever he puts us. Paul says in Romans 9.20, Shall the thing form say to him that form it? Why hast thou made me thus? How is how ungrateful it is for us to complain to a sovereign God about his will. How unseemly for the creature to complain to the creator about how he or she was created. And in all of this, the clay that yields to the potter touch, it brings happiness and satisfaction to the potter. The vessel that is finished and useful is a source of joy to the potter. And as we gladly surrender to his will for our lives, it will be a source of joy and pleasure to the master's potter. As we live our lives for our blessed master, let determine to yield in his hands. Let us not complain. God, the master potter, is longing for each of us to yield to him so he can shape us into vessels to be used in his kingdom. Jeff Syverson, he wrote, and I quote, the shaping process is hard and long. Trials come to shape us. Our faith is stretched and tested. But in all the stretching and pulling and shaping, 
His one design is to make us into a vessel he can use for his glory. End of quote. As we end with this video, remember that God has strategically positioned us in a time such as this. As I read before, the shaping process is hard and long. Trials come to shape us. Our faith is stretched and tested. But in all the stretching, pulling and shaping, his one design is to make us into a vessel he can use for his glory. And as we are going to usher in the last end time harvest and meet the bridegroom, let us determine to be yielded clay in his hands. 